Uh, Hillary has been lengthening her excuses as to why uh, she lost the election. She didn't really lose the election. It was stolen from her uh, by, I think it's up to 24 different excuses she has now. Number 24 is content farms in Macedonia. And uh, as I said, uh, my grandfather was a uh, Macedonian content farmer. And uh, we often think about, you know, gathering on the porch and recalling the old days on the Macedonian farm. I never thought... He never thought that the old content farmers he left behind in Macedonia would one day steal the U.S. presidential election. They are gnarled, hard-working Macedonian peasants, and the way they were able to reach out and uh, steal the election from a well and by John welcome is, to the Macedonian is, Content Farmers podcast, another exciting episode, episode 21. My name is Jason Miko, coming to you from the foothills of the Catalina Mountains, at the foot of the Catalina Mountains, that's what I'm supposed to say. i got to remember this. From the f- foot of the Catalina Mountains in Oro Valley, Arizona. And this is Svetin Shulimanov calling in from a, a windy and stormy Skopje, Macedonia. Oh, nice. I like it. Well, it's absolutely beautiful here. It's springtime. Uh, it is, we're recording this on Sunday, April the 7th. We are one week into Macedonia's presidential elections, which are first round April 21, second round May 5. And I think we have to begin, uh, you know, I think we're going to call this uh, anchors away because of the absolute ludicrous statement that Zoran Zaev, the prime minister of Macedonia, said about his candidate, or I should say Zaev's candidate and Ahmeti's candidate, uh, Stevo Pendorovsky. He called uh, Stevo Pendorovsky the anchor that pulls us forward, quote unquote. Now, look, okay, I get it. Macedonia is a landlocked country. Of course, you know, way back when, 100 years ago, it wasn't a landlocked country because Solon yeah? Uh And there are, there are plenty of lakes, beautiful lakes in Macedonia. There are boats on these lakes. They all have anchors. So most people know what the, the um, role, what, what, what an anchor is supposed to do. And uh, what, how did that play in Prelep, for instance, uh, Sutton? Oh, come on. Zaev is making so many gaps. This is really even <laughs> impossible to, to keep track. This is just normal, normal day in, uh, in Zaev land. Uh, yeah, uh, Sidanovska, the Vimera candidate, she also, she has this, uh, uh, proclivity to, to mistake the city she is in. So she, you know, she does this Bob Hope routine where she says, good evening, uh, Negotino, and it's Kavadarci. Uh, actually, she did it twice, but the, the first time she did it, it's really horrible because, uh, you know, she mistook, uh, uh, Negotino for Kavadarci, uh, yeah. and you don't do this. I don't know what your, you right. know, uh, local rivalry there in Tucson, but uh, in Kavadarci versus well, Negotino, you, you just don't do it. It's, uh, yeah, it, it would be, it would be Tucson versus Tempe, which is basically part of Phoenix and the two universities, Arizona State University and Tempe, the scum devils, mm-hmm. and the University of Arizona, the proud Wildcats, my people. Uh, it'd be the same type of thing. But you, you, it's funny, you call it a Bob Hope routine, which, and I've seen plenty of politicians do it here, um, you know, by, quote, I'm using air quotes, by accident, although they do it on purpose, just mm-hmm. because they're, they're traveling to so many different places and talking to so many different people and they don't know what city they're in and whatnot. Uh, I find that somewhat endearing on her behalf. Though, as you point out, you know the, the rivalry between those two towns. But I mean, to talk about an anchor that pulls us forward is just stupid. Yeah, there. Uh, Zayef is a adrenaline rush junkie lately. Uh, I don't know if it. I mean, I get in his position, I would be doing serious drugs. I mean, no way you would. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can do this on a. On hey, a don't sober. discount. Don't discount serious drugs. But he, instead of, as we're a landlocked country in this stage of our uh, existence, he's doing these uh, ATV mountain ri- biking, uh, riding through, you know. Uh, oh, yeah. C- closing down the entire ski lanes of uh, Mount uh, Mavrova so he can, he can ride his snowmobiles there. But we cannot do much uh, jet skiing and other stuff. Ad- otherwise, I'm, I'm sure he would be, be doing this. He would be yeah. spending his hard yeah. earned money on jet skis and stuff. Well, speak, speaking of, of gaffes and things like this, and, and I know we want to talk about some polls that 
have come out or were online and whatnot. But before that, I know Stevo Pendorowski was talking about, quote unquote, I'm using the air quotes again here, our country. Uh, and I'm always, you know, when, when he's doing his, uh, his routine, his, uh, his uh, stump speech uh, in his candidacy, and he won't say Macedonia, of course, yeah. and he doesn't really want to say, you know, North Macedonia, so he says our country. And I'm reminded, um, Chris Hill, the first U.S. ambassador to Macedonia back in 1996, uh, in his um, biography, which he put out a year or two ago called Outpost, he has a whole chapter uh, called, I think it's called This Country. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how, you know, when, when he was the ambassador, it, it was official U.S. policy was, quote, the former Yugoslav, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. And he would, didn't want to say that, obviously. So he kept saying this country, our, our country, your beautiful country. And he finally just got tired of it and said, to hell with this. I'm just going to say Macedonia and damn the torpedoes, damn the consequences, etc. And he started doing it, and nobody really cared. Uh, and I find it funny because the other day I saw, I think it was USAID, tweeted out something about this country or something like that. And I, you know, here we are, twenty almost 25 years later, back in the same situation where the, the internationals don't want to say North Macedonia, so they're saying your country, our country, this country, this beautiful country. And it's just, it's ludicrous. Just say Macedonia. Why? Because that's the name of the country. Yeah, that's, uh, they're not saying Macedonia. We, we can't play the national anthem in front of Tsipras. Even Zaf even said, oh, yes. uh, the army uniforms, he was saying, well, we should have maybe sewn something up quickly on the army uniforms so not to embarrass uh, our dear guest, uh, Alexis Tsipras. He was, uh, initially for a few days, they were lying that uh, the anthem was not played because uh, there was no time because Tsipras was flying in late. And, you know, it just takes a few minutes to uh, deploy the guard and sing the anthem. But after right. a few days of lying, they eventually owned up that it was done on Greek request because the anthem sings about Macedonia, not North Macedonia. It speaks about the Macedonian struggle for uh, Macedonian homeland, and you, you can't have that Absolutely. in front of Tsipras. And even the uniforms were problematic because they still have the name Republic of Macedonia or Army of um, the Republic of Macedonia. That's the full name of the army. And Zayev right. says we should have sewn something quickly up onto the... Or maybe use marker and uh, you know it's it's really some, disgusting. maybe some scotch tape and a couple of heavy markers and things like that it's oh disgusting. it's uh... pathetic pathetic cowardly disgusting and just plain wrong yeah and then there are these people who go to the rallies that's even worse i mean it's bad enough that pendarovsky is saying you know can't say the name of the country they have all these people who understand that the rallies is a on the air audition for a job and it's his work like there was this uh, like a showbiz personality who was supporting Zaev and after he formed the government she wasn't hired soon enough into some position so she called him out on Facebook uh, well you don't have time for a coffee now what's up with you you forgot about us and sure enough she was hired uh, like you know he, he publicly responded to her invited her for <laughs> for a coffee and you know let's get you hired somewhere quick and now everybody is doing it you have there was this a, a girl who was sucking up to Zav so badly. You're the, you know, you are the only person so far who has managed to change, to reverse the course of history in the Balkans. And then in in between, you know, she's coming out for air, and uh, 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 and then she says, uh, and she, she goes like, uh, by the way, I'm 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 an, I'm an expert in uh, some form of you know working with children who have been abused, and uh, you know we really should form this position, you know this office of a person who would work with them. So she's, this is literally a uh, on-the-air, live, television, televised job interview. She's asking for him to create the job, and she's uh, at the same time applying for it. And it's so pathetic. And then there were these two... So there's, there's a lot of dear leader worship going on, is what you're saying. Oh God, it's like Publicly. North Korea, yeah. not, not North Macedonia. It's horrible. Uh, oh, well, uh, let's let's... I want to talk about the polls because one just came out, but before that, I know that Bobby Christov, uh, the journalist with Telma, had an online poll uh, in which he listed the three candidates. But then, is it is it correct that he actually deleted that because uh, Gordana was uh, in the in the lead? Yeah, this was a Twitter poll. I mean, not scientific, uh, but you yeah, know, of the left as elsewhere owns Twitter, and they they imagine right. they're going to run away with it. So he did the poll. They had the debate on, on his television. Uh, on Telma Television, uh, Pendarovsky, Silyanovsky, and Bliri Mreka, the third candidate. And so he right. did a poll, and uh, Silyanovsky ran away with it, and she was actually okay, she was good, she was solid. I remember uh, 
back in 2014, the previous presidential elections, uh, Pendarovsko was debating uh, Georgi Ivanov and uh, all the Twitter, they believed that uh, Pendarovsky is going to win easily, but turns out he's not a very good debater. It was pathetic then, I was reading all their comments, they, they believed that the, the debate was uh, r recorded, true it was recorded, but then they believed that all the best comebacks by Pendarovsky were cut out and they were actually demanding that the Macedonian television releases the entire tape and then both campaigns had to say, no, it was, this was the entire tape, there was nothing else. This is what he said, he's just not a good debater, he sucks. And uh, besides, what he's defending is in, indefensible and extremely unpopular. And Sidanovska ran away with it. And then Bobby Christoph, bless him, he deleted the entire tweet. Uh, and, you know, his wife works for Radmila Shekerinska, the defense minister. So on one hand, you know, SDSM are all these, uh, are a bunch of backstabbers, so she would actually uh, be happy to see, you know, Pendarovsky destroyed uh, and, you know, make this conventional wisdom that he was destroyed. You know, Shekarinska right. would be happy with this. So maybe, you know, maybe Bobby was, you know, playing it smart for his wife, uh, but uh, ultimately he had to he had to delete the, the tweet and oh, no, that, it's even worse. That's funny. That's funny. Uh, well, you know, and, hey, look, you know, his wife worked for the defense minister. I understand he's got to say certain things. He, he has to support the government. He's got to eat. He's got to, you know, feed his family. You, you can't begrudge a man that. Um, yeah, but Sikorinska uh, wasn't so badly that, that she's the candidate. So <laughs> she wouldn't mind from that of losing, honestly. Yeah, but I and I just saw before we went uh, to record this, uh, Svet, that, that there was an actual poll that came out, and it had a lot of very interesting figures in it. What what uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, this is like a proper poll, uh, IPS poll published on Sittal Television. Sittal is hard pressed, you know, arrested and uh, seriously intimidated. Their editor in chief had to resign under pressure. Uh, Latas, you know, he's out uh, as editor in chief in Sittal. It's an end of right. era. So, you know, we should take the poll with a grain of salt, but it's still uh, like a serious poll. Pendarovsky is leading by, I think, two points, but it's within the margin of error. Um, Sidanovsky right. is right behind him. And uh, then, you know, Sidanovsky wins the Macedonian vote by several points, but then Pendarovsky makes up the difference with Dewey Albanian voters. Uh, there is right. a, a significant number of voters, uh, and this was even no noted by Sittal, who uh, say we're going to vote, but we're not telling you who for, which indicates that sure. people are afraid to uh, state their party allegiance. And this, this is like uh, like half of the votes Sidanovsky, Sidanovsky and Pendarovsky win. So if these intimidated voters, you, you know, you could imagine that uh, an intimidated voter would be a Vomera voter at this uh, uh, right. climate of persecution we're having. And, you know, who could blame them? People are being arrested literally every day for supporting the opposition right. so uh, this, I, this I've, I've just I've just pulled up the uh, some of the figures on the poll here 1100 people done in late March um, one of the things I thought was interesting was that um, uh, Silianovska polls much better among the other ethnic minorities in Macedonia 17.9 percent to 14.3 percent for Pendorovsky and I think it's important to remember that you know the majority of of people in Macedonia, of course, Macedonians, and then we have, you know, Macedonia's largest uh, minority, which is the Albanians, and the Albanians would like everybody to forget that there are other minorities in Macedonia that are happy to be Macedonian, they're happy to call the country Macedonia, and to support uh, the, you know, and to speak the Macedonian language, etc., and Silianovska is apparently doing much better among them than Pandorovsky. Yeah, they, they're, uh, I mean, you know, smaller groups, both uh, uh, Christians, like um, the Vlach and the Serbs, but also uh, Muslims, like the Turks and, you know, most of the Roma, they're feeling pressured by the Albanians. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, Turks are being uh, pressured to declare themselves as Albanians, Muslim Macedonians as well, uh, Roma, you know, you would get, um, you know, frequent fights between Roma and Albanians for you know, control of uh, businesses or even the schools in uh, the Shutka district. So, yeah, I mean, other smaller minorities, you know, they see Mas ethnic Macedonians by and large as more open-minded and more, uh, you know, tolerant than the Albanians. I, I mean, 
right. frankly, Albanians are pushing for territory in Macedonia. That there's no. Of course, well, that's that's, that's Ali Ahmeti 2001. You know, and and it will we'll always talk about that because that's the truth is that he wanted to split Macedonia in half. There's another interesting set of statistics in this poll which I want to point out, and that is uh, amongst public employees, public administration. Mm. Stevo Pendorovsky does 39% to 32% for Silianovska because their jobs depend upon it. Um, whereas amongst self-employed, businessmen, farmers, she beats Pendorovsky 35.2 to 17.6, or maybe that's rural versus urban. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, this is going to be fascinating, and I, you know, I'm not willing to make a prediction as to who's going to win. Uh, at least not at this point, uh, and and who knows? You know, I think after uh, Brexit and the election of Donald Trump, you know, uh, two years ago, I think polling is fraught with errors, and anything can happen. I think that's the lesson of of those two major events in Western civilization. So, but these are fascinating numbers. I actually sent them to some friends of mine that uh, do polling to to try and get their opinion. I'm still waiting to hear back from them. Yeah, most, I mean, Homer made a, an attempt to reach out to the uh, public administration and, you know, increasing their salaries exponentially. And uh, But ultimately, a conservative party should not trust the public administration. This is, we see, we're seeing it in this poll as well. Uh, they will vote for the government and, you know, when left to vote uh, uh, freely, they will vote for the leftist party. Like in the United States, a conservative party should reduce the public administration, not to try to Win it over. This Absolutely. is my takeaway here. Small government, uh, as our friend, as our mutual friend, um, Grover. Grover. Grover Norquist, yes. yes. Uh, as, as, he, as he likes to say, he doesn't want to eliminate government. He just wants to shrink it to the size where he can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub. <laughs> he once tried to pronounce my name. That was one of the funniest uh, uh, memories I have in my life of Grover trying to say That was beautiful. <laughs> True story. Actually, before he got married, he had a townhome uh, right on Capitol Hill uh -huh. uh, and uh, rented out extra rooms to uh, to people. Uh, and and uh, I had a girlfriend that uh, rented one of his rooms. Uh -huh. So um, so anyway, um, let's see. What else can we talk about here uh, on the election? Stevo Pendorovsky said something recently about the Going back to 2001, the Orchid Framework Agreement. Yeah, he was. He, he's really, uh, you know, he's uh, the only way he wins this. He's losing the uh, Macedonian vote and uh, he's trying to maintain the Dewey vote. But then, you know, there is this big reservoir of people who do not want to declare who they're voting for. And you could presume that they're mostly Vimero and, you know, the non-aligned, uh, undecided. You know, Vimero is definitely not running a proper Vimero candidate. They're running a centrist who even was part of the SDSM-led protest initially before True. True. Uh, it was... But completed. saw the error of her ways, so... Yeah. So she's yep. not offensive to the to the SDSM voters, so she's, she's very able to, to win uh, undecided. And then there is this large uh, pool of ethnic Albanian voters who, who are voting for Blair Imreka in the first round, and then they can switch either way and... You know, Ivanov was very successful in winning the more conservative Albanian vote in the uh, second round of the elections in 2014, uh, pending a political decision by their leaders like uh, Kasami and Sela, what would be more profitable to them. And, you know, right. supporting the government, they're not in the government. Why wouldn't they stick a knife in Dewey if they can? So, you know, Z uh, Pendarovsky is uh, scared from the undecided voters from the reliability of the Albanian voters overall. So he is trying to win over Albanian voters. And today, he, uh, or yesterday it was, he came out with, he basically threw uh, the Ohrid framework agreement through the window. The Ohrid agreement says uh, that the political uh, preference, you know, preferential political treatment Albanians get in Macedonia is conditioned on Albanians being 20% of the population in total. They polled. Right. They were they were uh, estimated at 25 during the 2002 census, and this was after the war. In, and the census was widely seen as uh, rigged and flawed, because if it was after the war, and if they were less than 25, 20 percent, there would have been a renewal of fighting. It was believed. And since then, there was we were unable to conduct a poll. The one time we tried, 
Albanians insisted, you know, Ahmed insisted that it stopped or that uh, unless Albanians are allowed to uh, be registered over Skype, basically, you know, uh, oh. citizens who have moved out of the country long ago, you know, we should do an honor system census where they, you know, uh, they call in and say, well, yeah, I'm actually intending to return sometime in Macedonia. I'm currently in Switzerland just for a brief while. Just please count me in. And they wanted to reach 25% or over 20% in this way. So uh, what Pendarovsky is now saying is that, and you know, if they're more than 20%, they get the right uh, in the parliament that their votes count much more than a Macedonian vote. So basically there is a set of laws you cannot pass in parliament just with a pure majority. You have to have the majority of the ethnic minorities. Right. So basically this covers all cult cultural rights. So we couldn't, for example, abolish the Albanian state uh, language state television uh, with Macedonian votes only. You, you know, if everybody, all the members of parliament, of Macedonian members of parliament voted to abolish it, uh, there would be like 90 of them and they could easily, out of 120, they could easily abolish it. But then the law says, you know, the constitution says you have to have the majority of the ethnic minorities. So there is this double majority and you cannot do it without the majority of ethnic Albanian votes. What, and now Pendarovsky says, even if Albanians are under 20%, and he insists, but no, you're not, he has to say this for his Albanian voters, but even if you are, I would insist that you would still have the rights or it's not the right, it's a political clout, it's a political influence in parliament. Um, and, you know, it's a, a pressure on the, on the actual majority. You could form an ideological majority in the parliament, but then the ethnic majority would uh, overrule you. Now, the, so basically he says, let's do away with the constitution. And uh, no matter how many uh, Albanians live in Macedonia, they should still have the rights uh, provided in the, you know, not the privileges, I would say, provided in the Ohrid Agreement, uh, even as if they were to more than 20%. The, the reason why this is so horrible for Macedonians now is that apparently uh, protection of cultural rights and other issues, it's not just cultural issues where this applies, uh, is, uh, you know, in place for Albanians, but not for the majority of Macedonians, because we can see that uh, you can force Macedonians uh, to change their name, uh, redefine nationality, change, you know, uh, symbols, etc. Uh, with uh, a minority of ethnic Macedonians voting for this, the majority being opposed to this, but then you add the Albanian votes onto the uh, way and then overweigh the majority of ethnic Macedonian voters. So precisely what was what the Ohrid agreement, the Ohrid agreement sets out to prevent in the case of the Albanians, precisely that was done to the Macedonians uh, with the 2016 elections, when the government was formed with an explicit mandate to rename the country, a majority of Macedonians voted against the Zayev government, but it was still created with, a, with literally all of the Albanian votes put together and overruling the will of the Macedonian people, the majority of the Macedonian people. The referendum, you know, we know what happened. Albanians gleefully voted to rename Macedonia and Macedonians, while Macedonians largely boycotted the referendum. And now, uh, you know, the, the constitution was amended with, you know, blackmail, bribed members uh, of parliament, you know, in the Macedonian camp, but the government is still propped up by a minority of Macedonian votes and uh, in parliament, of representatives in parliament. So, uh, Pendarovsky assures Albanians that uh, their privileges will be secured, while at the same time, uh, the left uh, and is using the Albanians is adding them to their numbers to abuse, to violate the rights of ethnic Macedonians. And on top of it all, so, he says that, you know, people are moving out of the country. So, you know, uh, Albanians are surely more than 20%. Uh, but I'm sure that Macedonians are not 64% as Macedonians, you know, were polled, uh, were uh, numbered in uh, uh, tw 2002 in that census. So he's basically trying to make this impression that if people are leaving the country, uh, no, you know, not only the absolute numbers are being reduced, but that the percentages are going down. <laughs> so he basically right. does not understand how percentages work, but he's trying to suck up to the Albanian voters, telling them, listen, Macedonians are declining, they're not 64%. He wouldn't repeat this in a, in a Macedonian district. He was saying this in an Albanian district, 
but you know we have an outflow of people in general but it's much stronger among ethnic Albanians I mean it's assumed that right. their numbers are re- being reduced by a much greater percentage than you know by a much greater rate than the numbers of Macedonians so m- m- making it plausible that Albanians are below 20% which by definition means that Macedonians are growing as a share of population if not in absolute numbers right well again so so just to sum it up I think uh, number one, he's playing identity politics to the hilt. Oh yeah, the left, the left. Uh, which what is never good. Never good for uh, any country. And he is. Uh, and and I think it was important to remind listeners that the last census was done in 2002, and the, this government, the Zayev Akhmeti government, are talking about doing the census next year. There's been questions about whether or not they would include ethnicity on it or not. But to your point. Pandorovsky is just saying whatever it takes to get elected without regard for the consequences. Now, I, I do want to say I think you know long term, uh, whatever is done can be undone, and I think that's important for the Macedonians to remember that. So whether it's Stevo Pandorovsky talking crap, uh, or you know the the so-called Prespo agreement, etc., all of these things can eventually be undone, um, but. Uh, first of all, we have to get through this election, see what happens. But beyond the election, let's kind of move on and talk about the fact that Macedonia is not going to get mm-hmm. a date for it to start talking about <laughs> EU membership. Yeah. It's not even a question of um, starting to open each of the individual chapters, the 35 or 36 chapters, which every EU aspirant country has to open, negotiate, and then close. We're talking about a date to even start that process, and as we recall, last year, last June, uh, the EU basically put off for another year talking about, and Macedonia was thrown in with Albania, uh, and it was primarily France and the Netherlands that that objected to opening the accession talks then. And then, of course, as I have said, no, we're going to change the name and everything else, and then the EU is going to give us a date to start talking, to open up the, the chapters, and that's not going to happen now. So I think it was uh, Johannes Hahn who said, what did he say exactly? Uh, I'm trying to remember the actual phrase. It was a preparatory yeah. stage of uh, yes. negotiations. Preparatory was the key word. Exactly. Preparatory was the key word. And then, and then Zayev gets on the phone with Merkel to beg her mm. to you know, change the situation. So, so not only has Macedonia had to change its name and its identity or anything else, but it's not going to get a date to start talking about EU membership and I think Albania is probably in the same situation. It's glorious, it's delightful it's, uh, <laughs> they did a saucy on this, they, they declared they insisted so strongly that we are definitely opening accession talks uh, in uh, June of this year uh, and you know last year after again France and the Netherlands blocked this France and the Netherlands blocked the opening of uh, EU accession talks for Macedonia and I have still insisted you know they did like this late night uh, follow-up on the European Council, the Luxembourgian, whatever he is, Prime Minister, President, he apparently reassembled the European Council and they told us we, uh, you know, we got out by the skin of our teeth and we still got the EU accession date and it's it's prolonged by a year, but it's definitely set cast in stone <laughs> for uh, June 2019 and now uh, everybody, you know, Zayef is now, well, yeah, but we of course meant that in June of 2019, we get, begin the preparations and we then actually negotiate in November or December or maybe January and he's trailing off here. And it's, uh, I mean, it would be the only way this would be even more delicious if it was uh, done, uh, you know, if uh, we would have our accession talks delayed for the actual reason they should be delayed, which is that we are now a dictatorship. The government that is using the police to arrest opposition people massively daily and we absolutely do not meet any criteria f- to join a proper a club of proper democratic countries which the eu is not i mean we are- oh hang on now no, no. i got i've got I, I have to intervene you, you you're calling the eu countries yeah. a club of proper democrats uh i'm gonna have to take issue with you on that you know we actually do belong in the eu with a government which Ign- uh, you know, calls for a referendum, then it ignores <laughs> the outcome, is uh, right. silencing the opposition with, uh, you know, hate speech, okay. arrest, but even going even okay. further well, than the, this. Yeah, those are our, sta- yeah. those are our standards for calling the EU yeah, countries yeah. Uh, 
Democrats, then yes. There is no way that the EU would, uh, you know, uh, ag agree to uh, block Macedonia from, from, from opening accession talks because it's arresting uh, vulnerable people. You know, obviously the EU loads and uh, wants to, was part of the uh, assault on the Vimera, of bringing down the Vimera government and he's invested heavily in Zayev's government, etc. So, you know, all of these actual violations of the rule of law are not being registered. They're not registered in the uh, U.S. Human Rights Report, which I, I didn't even bothering, bother reading this time, and it just took the few tweets by the U.S. Embassy to realize what's, what's in it. Uh, it's not in the OSCE pre-election report, which was published today, which should note things like, you know, the majority, you know, um, 15 members of parliament are being indicted and seven of them had their immunity revoked and you're holding elections. You know? it, it's not the way it works. But it doesn't know this. Wow. So, you know, it's not, nobody's going to object to the arrest and intimidation and persecution of the opposition in Macedonia. But still, we're gonna, uh, they're, they're going to deny us the accession talk because uh, apparently my, my reading of this situation is France realized how many Muslims live in Macedonia and uh, is taking issue with this. Hmm, interesting. Well, even if yeah, France has its own... Uh, less than 20%, it's still too much for, for France, apparently, so they don't want us in the, the EU. Sorry. Well, I think, and, and with respect to Macron in France, um, you know, there's, and just kind of talking slightly about uh, the difference of the Brexit, um, which is supposed to happen this Friday, April 12. Uh, May has asked for an extension again. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Macron, uh, he could actually torpedo the whole thing and say no, because he wants, he wants Britain out of the EU so that he can pursue his imperialist plans of a European army and you know ever closer union and everything else that goes with it to bring macedonia or albania into that would also i think upset part of those plans which is probably why he's saying no so macron could actually end up doing everybody a favor here by by saying uh you gotta have a hard uh, a crash a uh, crash out on the eu on brexit on friday the 12th and no to macedonia uh, and of course albania later in june we will see. Uh, Shakirisk offered soldiers to France uh, for Chad and Mali and whichever other colony they're trying to discipline now. And she did this uh, literally days after the French European uh, Affairs Minister. She told us that uh, we're not allowing you to open accession talks. So even after this, our first response was, we'll, we'll give you soldiers, whichever African whole country you're attacking at this point <laughs> we'll, we'll send you the troops no matter what you know just please give us the the accession date and, and you know probably the best uh, thing we have to do now to get uh, so, so you know eu is slipping out of the uh, out of our grasp but then even nato is looking shaky because uh, you know turkey took great umbrage when the, the zaf government they gave like a few thousands of euros to a newspaper published you know a turkish language newspaper the zaman but it's being published by the Gulen organization. It's a Gulenist newspaper. So, no, a big, a big no-no there. Yeah. So uh, they forced the newspaper to uh, give the money back. So the government would not pull back its decision, but the newspaper wow. said, okay, we don't want this. Uh, but now, as a follow-up move, Turkey demands that we extradite about 15 people. Uh, I presume Turks living in Macedonia, citizens... Yep or at least residents. We have not been told if they're citizens, which would make it a bit more difficult. Some of them, the smart yep. ones, have already fled the country. And uh, But, you know, they, they, they gave us a list. They want us to close down a, a school, which is run by Gulen as well. It's one of the biggest, poshest uh, uh, foreign... Uh, the high school? Uh, yeah. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Yaha Kemal. Uh, yeah, Yaha Kemal. Uh, so now, uh, Shekinsky is out saying that uh, if we do not agree to their request, they may not give up on ratifying our NATO accession, but, you know, they may severely prolong it or delay it for a while. So, uh, and, you know, all, everybody needs the SM when, uh, during the coup in 2016, it happened literally at a time when, you know, very high tensions in Macedonia. A lot of people on the, on SDSM saw the attack on Erdogan as, okay, it's part of the Balkan Spring and, you know, uh, so Jess Bailey was uh, a U.S. diplomat in Ankara during the Gezi protests. 
So, you know, yep. it was clear that from the style of the protests, you know, from what even Erdogan was saying, that the U.S. is organizing the protests against me. So in Macedonia, we were strictly divided. On the left, people were cheering the protesters on in the army, bring down the Islamist thug, bring back this, bring back the secular, secularizing socialist uh, army and uh, CHP, what's the name of their uh, uh, leftist party. While on the right, everybody was, uh, okay, we are rooting for Erdogan and President Ivanov was one of the first people who called him and expressed his support that we stand with the legitimate government of Turkey. So everybody on the right. left was on the side of the uh, putschists here, of the coup organizers, and now they have to extradite uh, 15 people so they would be so that Erdogan would allow us to join NATO. It's delightful. Wow. Well, I think, um, and of the 20, the 29 member states of NATO, I think 10 or 11 have ratified uh, Macedonia's uh, accession to NATO so yeah. far. That leaves the rest. The United States hasn't. I, I saw something the other day, so the United States might take it up. And, it, and here it's the U.S. Senate that has to vote on treaties. That's one of their tasks as uh, one of our two bodies of, uh, of, of Congress. Um, but it'll be the fall. And I know that everybody's trying to do it. So we just celebrated, we, NATO just celebrated 70 years, uh, April 3rd and 4th in Washington. And I think April 4th was the actual date. But then there's another meeting in London in December, which was where the first NATO headquarters was uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, located when it was first created. And I know, I know they want to have another big celebration there in December. And we'll see if Macedonia actually is a member by then. Mm -hmm. um, but... But going back to what you said, yeah, it's interesting. We're here. We are talking about we're talking about Brexit. We're talking about what's going on in France. We're talking about what's going on in Albania. We're talking about what's going on in Turkey, and all of these events, obviously, and what's going on in these countries and the politics and the back and forth, etc., have an impact on Macedonia. And and who's standing up for Macedonia? Well, apparently, it's not the government. The government is going every which way, trying to please everybody. And we all know that you can't please all the people all the time. And yet, that's what the government is trying to do whether it's Turkey, whether it's the EU, whether it's France, every single country, the, the, the government of Macedonia, the government of Zoanzaev is trying to please them on every different thing. And, and there's no strategy in that. It's just, it's, it's totally reactive. Yeah. There, is no, there is no strategic plan for Macedonia right yeah, now, this, which is unfortunate. This approach, even countries who do not have an issue or do not have a bone to pick with us, will find one because if you're literally right. giving up everything, you know, we have Romania, further away will come and tell us, okay, we want you to recognize the Vlach minority as Romanians, mm -hmm. to recognize mm -hmm. that you have a minority here. We'll have, you know, unassuming countries coming up making requests. We'll have, obviously, Turkey, we'll have uh, uh, making requests, we'll have uh, Russia. You know, it, it's, we're not projecting strength, we're not projecting sovereignty, and, you know, we're just opening up ourselves up for, for you know, anybody and everybody who... Would you, come in, yeah. come in and take a piece of us, you know. Um, speaking of taking a piece of us, um, I, I see that the uh, the uh, the so-called quote-unquote uh, immigration crisis is kind of rearing its ugly head again, especially down in Greece. We've had a number of uh, events in the past week of migrants uh, from uh, Middle East and Africa, etc., trying to make a push towards the border with Macedonia. Yeah, I've, I've been to this camp. Basically, you know, they have a closed camp, uh, uh, a family camp where the people oh. who are there, they, they, they came, they arrived with their children, and basically you cannot expect them to make a trek across the border. But then there was right. an open camp, which uh, essentially had, uh, you know, the 15 and above males who arrived uh, uh, single, who arrived on their own. And this was mm -hmm. this camp was completely open to migrant smugglers. So basically, they would tell them whenever you feel ready, or you have, you know, if you have enough money to pay the smuggler, etc., he'll make, take you on the track across the border. So this camp was being emptied constantly, but obviously not at the rate which uh, we had during the migrant the crisis. 2015, and, right? Yeah. But now they're they're getting anxious, and this this happened while Tsipras was in Skopje, and you have two socialist oh, leaders. Wow. Tsipras was actually organizing the ferry from the islands to Athens, which was the root of all the problems, which caused the crisis. Because, you know, once you make the trip from Turkey to some of the Greek islands, you're stuck there. Tsipras was organizing right. the ferries for two years from Chios and uh, uh, Lesbos, etc., 
to the Piraeus port in Athens, and then uh, <coughs> where you can easily take a, a train to Solon, and then just, you know, uh, make the short trip to the border. So he was instrumental wow. in creating the crisis, and now he's meeting Zaev in Skopje, and you know, we know the people in Zaev's government, they so badly want to open the border, they believe in this, they would make statements in this regard, many of their colored revolution supporters are actually currently working on projects to open the border, to improve the perception of migrants, you know, producing these videos. USA produced a video promoting having migrants settle in Macedonia. Uh, oh, I remember that, and then they took it took down. It down because this is b before elections, and they don't want this right. type of publicity. But um, they so badly want to do it. We know the diplomatic core in Skopje, you know, we've met these people. They want to do this. But, you know, now it's right in front of, uh, ahead of the European elections and Brexit, and they cannot afford this. But uh, right. deep in their hearts, they want to open the border. And frankly, so do I, because, you know, if um, we have to school the people in, in Macedonia and in the Balkans and in Europe on the harm that comes when you vote for the left, well, then, you know, the sooner the better. Yeah. This, this is a global progressive project, at least in Western civilization, is no walls, no borders, open borders, have everybody come in. But the very simple reason for it is because they want fresh um, bodies that will then vote for them. It's all about power at the end of the day. Uh, and you mentioned what Cyprus was doing, bringing the, the migrants from the islands uh, into uh, mainland Greece, into mainland Europe. Same thing's going on, we've had it you know, with Mexico, with buses literally from the southern border of Mexico, bringing Hondurans and Guatemalans and Nicaraguans and Salvadorans mm -hmm. all the way up to our border. And families, you know, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was just single young men, which is a different situation than families. Mm -hmm. Um, but the whole progressive project is designed to try and bring as many people into the United States, into the European Union, and then turn them into, and then of course give them welfare benefits and everything else, and then turn them into, in this case, in our case, Democrats, literally registered members of the Democrat Party, mm -hmm. and the various leftist progressive socialist parties in Europe as well. And, and that's, that's just, you know, Beto O'Rourke, the uh, Texas, uh, former Texas congressman who's running for president actually wants to tear down existing yeah. walls that members of his own party voted to put in place. Um, which, you know, the whole thing's upside down. Yeah, the, the natives know them so, so far too well to vote for them. That's the, that's the problem. But the, you know, <laughs> the migrant crisis, you have this... I mean, this is one of those comments too, too good to check, uh, basically, in Serbia. Yes. They had uh, there are these distinctly Balkan situations which happen when you know, war, migration, refugees, etc. This dark humor we have here. Because, again, we have to take things in stride, because if you take things seriously here, you'll go crazy. So there was this uh, tweet from Serbia, a guy made a great joke, he says, and, you know, it might be true, but probably not, and who cares. Uh, too good to check. <laughs> he says there was this guy from uh, 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 a village in the south of Serbia, from Blasutinca, and he bought, uh, they want to make money, smuggling migrants, mm -hmm. taking them through Serbia. and But you get caught, you get arrested. So he allegedly uh, bought a white van and he bought a lot of sparkly clothes like uh, and white shirts and he bought some mu musical instruments. So he's picking up his groups of migrants he has uh, uh, chartered and he's dressing them up as musicians and because of their complexion they look exactly like a Roma uh, band, you know, which oh you would goodness. get to your wedding. And he's just driving them across Serbia and waving to the police saying, hello. And if he gets stopped, he says, well, just taking the band. We have a, a gig uh, in this village playing at this wedding. So, you know, and allegedly he was arrested when uh, one of the policemen actually asked them to play a song. <laughs> oh, how funny. Well, let's do this. Why don't, why don't let's take some of that, find some of that music and put it in here while we take a quick break and then come back with our farmer's picks. Sounds good.
And welcome back to the Macedonian Content Farmers Podcast. This is Clayton Sulimano from Skopje and the Jason Miko is on the line from Tucson, Arizona. Jason, it's time for our Farmers Picks. Uh, what have you got for us? Well, thank you, Sven. You know, I always kind of like to end, and maybe I'm moving more towards this as we do more of these podcasts, end on a positive note. And, um, you know, I especially like uh, promoting Macedonia, talking about all of the wonderful things to do and see and eat and drink in Macedonia. So I, f- I find these websites, uh, blogs, actually, every now and then. Uh, this one, 25 Things to Do in Macedonia. And we'll post it in the uh, show, note- show notes. It's amateurtraveler.com. Um, and, you know, obviously he's, he's got, you know, where's Macedonia? And then he talks about Skopje and all of the different things to do in Skopje. Vodno, uh, trails on Vodno, Kale, uh, Matka, of course. Um, let's see what else has he got. Kokino, Stobi. Well, it's 25 things. Uh, Heraklea, Prelep. Um, oh, Sopat. Oh, see, uh, I've just, oh, this is a fantastic picture. Too bad this is a podcast and you can't see this, but it, this, this, uh, woman drinking a glass of Macedonian wine overlooking these beautiful vineyards as the sun is just coming down. She's got a, a plate of delicious Macedonian food and the the, the, the uh, paragraph that goes with the picture talks about the wineries along the Vardar Valley and Svetin right now I just want, I'd, I'd like to go down to my local store and pick a bottle of Timjanica but I can't because we don't sell it here and I really want glass, I really want a bottle of Timjanica right wow. now. Uh, but anyway, well, uh, Khrushchevo, uh, you know, Mavrovo, of course, etc. Uh, and of course, Olkrit and, and much more. So we'll put that in the show notes. 25 things to do in Macedonia. Always, always fun to come across these blogs by random travelers that have discovered the beauty of Macedonia and have taken time to write about it and include these fantastic, beautiful pictures of Macedonia. So that is my farmer's pick Svetin, what's well, yours? I'm going to post a few uh, comments from my favorite uh, tourist guide from Macedonia, which is uh, uh, the Dutch ambassador Voter Plomp. He, <laughs> <laughs> you know where this He's is your going. favorite, your favorite tourist He's guide. The places he never knew existed <laughs> in the country, but uh, there's well, good for him. there's this thing he tra- <laughs> he he's in, a, in on a row. He's posting pictures from the Matka Canyon recently, uh, and then from Struga oh. today. But uh, the thing is that uh, wherever he goes. Um, it's also a reminder of the of the degradation and the collapse we're experiencing at the same time because you know he was in Matka he was taking pictures but it's becoming a lawless place where uh, a bunch of local thugs which are apparently even uh, uh, involved in Pendarovsky's campaign in this region it turned out that the people who are supporting him who are running his uh, campaign in the region have pictures with him etc they're illegally building a few platforms to put uh, restaurants in the canyon basically crowd out the canyon and uh, there were no permits, people were protesting, the municipality said we can't touch them, they're too powerful, the mayor said it's not in our preview, you know, so we cannot do it, essentially saying they're untouchable, and then there is water taking pictures, I think of his brother, mountain climbing on Matka, cropping out, trying not to, to catch a glimpse of these happening at the same time where apparently nobody can touch these thugs. And then today he posts a picture of Struga. He says, beautiful Struga, you know, the bridges uh, where the seven dream flows out of the Ohrit, etc. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. lovely. But then, uh, you know, uh, the Dewey mayor of Struga, another guy who operates with complete Im- impunity, he was bragging on television a few days ago how he bought, he purchased the 60,000 euros Audi and the journalist is telling him, well, yeah, we're trying to put Gruevski in prison because he purchased an armored Mercedes for the government, for Angela Merkel and Theresa May, and we're trying to turn spin this into a crime, and we're trying to arrest him. But there you are, you idiot, you're purchasing an overpriced vehicle for yourself. And he says, yeah, but you know, I'm the mayor of Struga, what would it look like if I was driving a Škoda? You should try the car, it's so great. He's totally not getting what the journalist wants him to do. So completely doesn't care about appearances. And then there are people, uh, 
he's not stopping them. I can't say they're tied to him, like in the case of Matka, but the least I can say he's not stopping them. They're burning down these reed uh, patches around the lake, uh, uh, which are which are true an obstruction of the beaches, but they're I guess important for the environment or something. They do something about the fish and the the frogs and whatever, uh, and. Uh, there are people burning them down. I guess they pour gasoline, you know, a few ga- uh, a few buckets of gasoline across on the lake, and then burn down the reeds. And then once uh, they're burned, oh, hang yeah. on. Sorry, you're, sorry, you're talking about Lake Ocrid yeah. and people yeah. putting gasoline on the reeds yeah. in the lake. <laughs> and this is a UNESCO protected site. Yeah. That is criminal. Well, UNESCO is welcome to try and stop them. Uh, the mayor of Struga is certainly not going to do that. And once it's burned down, they basically then uh, pave the, the way. And, uh, you know, of course, they burn down the reeds on the, on the ground as well. But they try to clear out the, the ones in the lake as well. And then they just uh, expand their beach. Or in one case, literally the day after the fire, after all the reeds were burned down, somebody started construction work on the site and preparing his new beach and platforms, you know, restaurants, beach bars, etc. And uh, and again, there was water plump snapping a picture on, uh, uh, in Struga, but, you know, he was so lucky to avoid uh, fires around the lake, which would, uh, which is what is going on. But, uh, you know, there, no environmentalist would react to this because uh, this would mean rocking the boat of the ruling coalition. You know, if this happened during Vimera, time you know they, they literally stopped Vimera from building a proper highway uh, along the lake which would have developed the existing beaches and you know reduced this horrible congestion we have in summer when people are trying to drive back from the beach but uh, now that it's ASDSM and Due doing it uh, well who cares well hopefully well we want to thank the Dutch ambassador for calling out um, attention to these environmental problems no, not, that not, are he's, taking place. He's, he's not, well, no, inadvert, no, inadvertently, yeah. because you are commenting on his tweets. So we, we uh, in a roundabout way, that is what he is doing. And so that's one of the benefits of listening to this podcast, folks, is that you, you find out about some of the environmental problems that are going on uh, via the same people that would not normally call attention to these things. Uh, so... Um, that's a very interesting farmer's pick, Sven. 